بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم يا صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة صلى الله على المظلوم الشهيد أبا عبد الله الحسين غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا We can recite very loudly together unanimously a salam to Imam al Hussein. As salam ala al Hussein wa ala Ali ibn Hussein. وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters and I send my condolences to everyone present and to our Imam the Imam of time صاحب العصر والزمان and to our grand scholars, our esteemed jurists, on the anniversary in which the entire world comes together to commemorate, to commemorate, to remember the brutal murdering that took place 61 after Hijrah. The murdering or the murder of Imam al Hussein, the murdering of his family members, his companions. An event in history that shaped the society that we currently live in today. Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, based on the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, was described to be an ark of salvation. إن الحسين مصباح هدى وسفينة نجاة. A lantern of light and an ark of salvation. What was the role of the ark in the Holy Quran? In the chapter of Noah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Noah, and when he refers to the ark of Noah, in what context 
was the Ark of Noah mentioned in? The context that it was mentioned in was an Ark of Salvation. That if you had embarked on the Ark, then you would have survived when the great wave came to wipe the earth. And the Quran places a very, very important emphasis that the moment the ark drifts away, there is no more opportunities to catch up to it. And that's why when the son of Noah said to his father, Oh my father, I will resort, I will resort to the mountains. If you look at the mountains, look at how high they are. It will take hours for you to reach the top of the mountain, if not days. I will go up to the mountain to protect me from the water. So then Noah turns around to his son. He says that there is no one that will be safeguarded after today. If you want to go up on the mountain... You want to ride an airplane in today's language. You want to ride a helicopter. No one will be saved. Except those that hold on to the Ark of Salvation. And the Ark of Salvation today is Imam al Hussein, And after him, his grandson, Imam al-Mahdi Abdullah Ta'ala Farajah al-Sharif. Allahumma salli ala my brothers and sisters, when it comes to the topic of Muharram, we all know the merits of Muharram. We all know why we are here to commemorate. I leave the talk of explaining the significance of this month to scholars that are far more knowledgeable than me. But one thing that everyone can agree upon is that through attending these nights, these ten nights every year, the result of attending these nights are strong warriors today fighting against the Zionists in South Lebanon and around the world that have come together to fight against Zionism. It is the Shia of Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, through these nights that learnt courage. When you attend a gathering like this, and then you leave, you go home, you go back to work, you go back to live in the society that you live in. You always remember that I have values. That I have etiquettes that I need to follow. I have ethics that I need to abide by. And these etiquettes, the system of morals that I operate by, I was taught them in the gatherings of Imam al Hussein. Most specifically the 10 days in the year where everyone comes together. The person that is religious, the person that isn't religious, the person that probably only prays one day a year. All of these people come together as brothers and sisters to commemorate the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So it's very important that when you sit here tonight, my brothers and sisters, the moment you walk in through that door, understand that I am not entering into the center that I have been entering every day or I have been entering in certain occasions throughout the year. These ten nights are different. You know, when we refer back to the holy month of Ramadan, we say that this is the month of Allah. A month in which you will you were invited to be in the company of Allah, to be a guest of Allah. The month of Muharram is the same. It is a month where we renew our allegiance with the Ahlul Bayt with the Imam of our time. And what is the goal of real we? Paying my allegiance, realigning my values with the values of my imams. The result of that is courageous men and women that stand up in the face 
of tyranny and oppression. I have three points to mention tonight, my brothers and sisters, and then inshallah I will leave you. The first point is a very brief introducting, introduction to the month of Muharram. To see what did the Ahlul Bayt السلام, describe this month as being? How did this month affect these infallible beings? What impact did this month have on certain Imams in history? And then I will get to the second point that I have titled it as the gatherings of darkness. Through that I will explain that there are certain gatherings that we sit in brothers and sisters that increase in nothing but darkness in our lives. And then I will head to the third point where I will mention the gatherings of light. And then I will conclude with the fourth point which is debunking an accusation or a question that people ask. And why is it that we focus so much on history? Shouldn't we just leave history, his story in his time and move on? Because today you might be questioned about why is it that you still mourn al Hussein 1,400 plus years later? It was a historical event that took place. Leave history behind us. Move on. 21st century. People are going to the moon. People are traveling in space rockets and everything. It's time to leave history behind us. One quick sh short story that I remember. Since I mentioned the fact that people are going to the moon. I was in Iraq a few weeks ago. And I remembered everyone in my dua from this blessed center. I remember I was in the car with a guy. And it was a very odd scene. We seen a horse and, a, and someone riding it. And a carriage in the streets of Karbala. Which is very odd to see now. So then the man turns around and he says, Look, people have gone, the, the West has gone to the moon. And we're still here riding horses and carriages. So I turned around and I said to him, what do you mean that the West has reached the moon? The West is going through a crisis that you don't know about. But nonetheless, that's not a story for today. Inshallah ta'ala. So just because others have gone to the moon doesn't mean that they are ahead of anyone else. Inshallah ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When it comes to certain Imams, let me read to you a narration to paint a picture. And the picture that I intend to paint my brothers and sisters is what mood did the first day of Muharram turn certain infallibles in? So what mood did they go into when this day, the first of Muharram, a day like today, arrived? Imam al-Rada alayhi salam narrates that when the month of Muharram commences, my father, al-Kadhim alayhi salam, would not be seen laughing. And his depression would overcome him until the ten days had passed. And if it was the tenth day, the day of Ashura, that day would be a day of calamity, sadness and crying. And he would say this is the day that al Hussein was killed. So when you are questioned by certain people about why is it that you focus on the first 10 days of Muharram. This is what we call a sunnah, a teaching. That we inherited back from our Imams Imam Imamul Kadhim would not be seen laughing, would not be seen exercising joy and participating in joyful activities. And this is a message 
to us, my brothers and sisters, that when the month of Muharram arrives, the entire atmosphere of my house changes. Similar to the mosque, we see that all of these black banners have come up. It shows others that the Shia have entered into a season of mourning. And when we enter into the season of mourning, it's not mourning any random man that came in history. It was the greatest man after Rasulullah and his father, Amir al muminin and his brother al Hassan is al Hussein. So when we mourn these nights, we are following a prophetic message. And inshallah, throughout the night, I will bring evidence from the book of the other side where the Holy Messenger speaks to Umm Salama, and these narrations are present in the other books. And he says to Umm Salama, One day, one, two, and three is going to take place. Imam Rada alayhi salam narrates to Ibn Shabib. Ibn Shabib was a title for. The man by the name of Ar-Rayan. He says, I entered upon Imam al-Rada alayhi salam on the first of Muharram. And he said to me, O oh son of Shabib, Muharram is the month in which people of the pre-Islamic times forbade fighting in it due to its sanctity. Which is a message that even in the time of ignorance, the time of Jahiliyyah, there were certain months that had sacred meanings behind them. And the month of Muharram also coincided within, with one of these other months that the pre-Islamic times had sanctified. So he says, this nation did not know the sanctity of this month. Nor did they know the sanctity of its, of its prophet. The people didn't know. They neglected the month, but they also neglected their prophet. Because when they went to fight al Hussein, it wasn't a random man that they were fighting. It was the son of the prophet, the flesh of the prophet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Inshallah also we will speak about that saying in coming nights. I don't intend to make all the nights that I'm speaking about, speaking about narrations and ideological, crucial ideological points. But considering today is the first night, I will be speaking in the way that I'm speaking today. Inshallah I have many topics. Topics that our society is in dire need for. Number one, heedlessness and our future. Ghafla. Where to next? Okay, I wake up today, I go to work. Where is my community heading? Where am I as a youth heading? What am I doing with myself? Another topic that I have is discussing the scales of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that when we look at certain things, I judge you based on your wealth. I judge you based on the way you look in society. These are the scales that we have. Wealth and money and luxury. But what are the scales of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because these affect the society that we live in today, my brothers. So then Imam al-Rada alayhi salam continues to say to Ibn Shabib, they did not know the sanctity of its prophet in this month and they killed his descendants, captured his woman. One of the hardest things that you can put a human being that has protective jealousy, the hardest situation that you can put him is in is to capture his woman, is to take his woman as captives, as ransom. And that's why when enemies try to attack others, what do they try to do? They try to say, does he have any woman in his family? Does he have any young children? So that they can take them as ransom. So that the other person gives in. 
So then Imam al Rida alayhi salam says, and my brothers and sisters, what Imam al Rida then continues to say to Ibn Shabib is a message to you and I. If we want success, success is found in Hussein. If we want honor, honor is found in Hussein. If you want a life filled with blessings, it will be found with Hussein. That's why when you look at all of the actions, on the first day of the holy month of Ramadan, it's recommended to visit al Hussein. On the nights of Qadr, it's recommended to visit al Hussein. On the 15th of Sha'ban, it's recommended to visit al Hussein. On the day of Arafah, it's recommended to visit al Hussein. On the day of Ashura, the eve of Ashura, it's recommended to visit al Hussein. All of these significant on the day of Eid, it's recommended to visit al Hussein. All of these significant dates in Islamic history, you will find that it has a connection to al Hussein. Visit al Hussein on this day. Ibn Shabib says that Imam al Rida said to me that if I desire to meet Allah and there is no sin on my plate, then visit al Hussein. If you want to get rid of your sins, you visit al Hussein. Oh, son of Shabib, if you desire to live in rooms built in paradise with the Prophet of Allah, then curse the killers of al Hussein. Oh, son of Shabib, if you desire to be ranked and leveled up with the Ahlul Bayt, then become sad for our sadness and become joyful for our joy. Your entire life, like it is today, is programmed around these infallible beings. That's a very, very brief introduction to the month of Muharram. And like I said, I will let the scholars that are far more knowledgeable about me, you can refer back to them in relation to more information about the month of Muharram. As I mentioned, these gatherings, my brothers, are a school to every single one of us. In my introduction, I said, if you want to learn courage, come to these gatherings. If you want to learn to become a man, you come to these gatherings. If you want to learn how to open up a family, you come to these gatherings. However, not every gathering that we attend or we participate in, my brothers and sisters, is beneficial for us. And that's why we have the concept of the gatherings of darkness. Look at the term gathering like a coin. On the back side, you have darkness. And on the front side, you have light. Every gathering that we attend to in our life is like a coin. There is an aspect in gatherings that have light. And there are aspects in gatherings that have darkness instilled within. You might say, okay, you're throwing all of these terms. What do you mean? Explain to me the gatherings of light and the gatherings of darkness. When you see oppression, my brothers and sisters, oppression is something that we can witness. But it's also something that we can participate in. Let me read to you this narration. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, Whoever amongst you witnesses an evil action. This is what is obligatory upon us, my brothers and sisters. Whoever witnesses an evil action, let him change it with his hand. In the society that you live in, if you see that this action is wrong, this action is evil, try to change it with your hand. And if you are unable to do so, then try to change it with your tongue. Try to spread awareness. And if you are unable to do so, then with your heart. And this is the weakest of belief. That when you see wrong, you try to change it with your hand. You see someone being oppressed, you step in. You step in physically to help them. If you can't do that, 
than with your tongue. You stand up, you raise banners, you pay people to broadcast this information all around the world. You do whatever you can to change this evil that is present in society. If I can't do that, then in my heart, oh Allah, I disassociate myself from such an action, from such a thing. In another narration, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, this is very crucial. Pay attention to the words Imam al-Sadiq uses. If you believe in Allah and the last day. What's the last day, my brothers and sisters? The last day, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, the day of? Yeah, the day of judgment, possibly. Those days, the Akhirah. If you believe in Allah and the last day, then you should not sit in a gathering which an Imam is disrespected, or your brother, his status. Is attacked. So if I believe in Allah and the last day, and I sit in a gathering that my brother in Islam is being backbited and slandered and spoken about, and his family is brought into the conversation and everyone is speaking bad about them, then I ask you a question Does that mean that you have believed in Allah and in the last day correctly? Because if I believe in Allah and in the last day, I don't backbite my believing brother in Islam. I don't slander him. I don't attend gatherings just to speak about people. And this is probably, unfortunately, found with our elderly. Not those present in today's society. Back in the days when there were no TVs present. They would bring their friend together. There is a Lebanese dish, it's called vine leaves. There's a, there's a saying that goes around that if you want to backbite, if the women want to go backbiting about another woman, they bring the vine leaves and the rice together, they go to their friend's house and they start wrapping up the vine leaves and speaking and speaking and speaking for hours about everyone. My brothers and sisters, if we believe in Allah and in the last day, then we shouldn't backbite each other. We shouldn't speak about each other. And Allah describes this in the Holy Quran. He says, would you like to eat from the flesh of your brother? But then I ask you a question. And I want you to answer this question inside your heart. Why is it that when we see gatherings, for example, places that we shouldn't be in, gatherings that information that we shouldn't be listening to is spread. Why is it that we find in these gatherings there is joy? Why is it that sometimes when you're flicking through social media, you see someone probably partying and you say, oh, just if we could do that, but it's haram. Just if we had that flexibility. Why is it that we tend to feel like that. It's because shaitan has placed within us ropes. And through these ropes, he tries to convince us that certain things are entertaining. Oh, it's fun to go, for example, and place your money in gambling machines. It's fun, you can win money. People are working, they spend their money, they go, you know, it's, it's fine if I throw in $20, $50. I win, I win, I don't win, I don't win. And the person perceives this to be joy and I'm enjoying myself. This is dangerous. Because shaitan, your greatest enemy, my brothers and sisters, your greatest enemy, has convinced you that the worst things that you can do are pretty basic. And the best way to diagnose yourself is when you look at, 
for example, these actions, these wrongdoings, are you attached to them? Are you inclined to them or not? If you are, this is when you start the internal war, where you wage war on yourself. In what way? Do I physically torture myself? No. I reformat my entire beliefs, ethics, morals, and values. But this all stems back to the gatherings that I participate in. If I participate in a gathering of darkness, this is the result. On the other hand, my brothers and sisters, on the other hand, my brothers and sisters, the gatherings of light, you know the beautiful thing when you hear the children speak, is that you understand that these are guests of Imam al Hussein So if anyone is, is annoyed, leave them. They are the Imam's guests, they're not ours. The gatherings of light, my brothers and sisters, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam says, Rush to the gardens of paradise. So then the Imam alayhi salam was asked, What are the gardens of paradise? So Imam al Hassan alayhi salam said, The gatherings of remembrance. The gatherings of remembrance are gardens of paradise. These gatherings, my brothers and sisters, there are three blessings that we benefit from in these gatherings. Number one is the feeling of safety and tranquility. When you come into the gatherings of Imam al Hussein, you feel a sense of safety. Because I know that whatever takes place, it's in the hands of Al Hussein. And you sense to feel freedom from the outside world. Because through Al Hussein, your freedom today lays in debt to him. Number two, the fulfillment of prayers. If you have a need that you want, some of you boys want to get married, some of you boys want to open up businesses, some of you boys want to achieve something in life. These gatherings, some people want to have children, some people are trying to conceive. These gatherings are the gatherings where your wishes are fulfilled. If you have a prayer that you want to be accepted, come to the gatherings of Al Hussein. A narration that Rasulullah narrates, Rasulullah states, this narration is found in Bihar al Anwar. Rasulullah says, Al Hussein is one of the doors to paradise. If you want your needs to be accepted, to be fulfilled, knock on the door of Al Hussein. Number three is knowing Allah and His vicegerents. Imam al Sadiq narrates to Dawood ibn Sarhan. He says to him, O Dawood, convey my greetings to my followers and say, May Allah have mercy upon a servant who gathers with another and discusses our matters. Did anyone pick something up in this one sentence? I'll read it again. Imam al Sadiq narrates. Convey my greetings to my followers and say, May Allah have mercy upon a servant who gathers with another to discuss our matters. The mercy of Allah, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we said that if you have a need, you come to this gathering to ask for your need. And then Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is saying that if two believers come together to speak about a narration, it doesn't have to be a majlis, a gathering covered in black and white. No, any two believers that come together to speak about the remembrance of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt. Allah 
showers this person with mercy. Are you comprehending when I say that Imam al-Sadiq is making dua for you? If you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look at you with mercy, sit with your friend and mention a narration. Sit with your wife and mention a narration. Sit with your family and mention a narration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy automatically falls upon me. And no two people gather to remember us except that Allah glorifies them. Do you know what it means by Allah glorifies them? Allah turns to the angels and He says to them, Look at this servant. Look at how he is sitting with his brother. Look at how they are discussing. Allah, as you would say, shows off these two servants to the rest of His angels. So if you gather, then occupy yourself with remembrance. For in your meeting and your discussion is the revival of us, the Ahlul Bayt. You might ask, how do I become from the best of people that Allah created? Imam al-Sadiq says, And the best of people after us, the Ahlul Bayt, is the one who recalled our memories and called to our remembrance. They are the best of people. So if you call to the path of Allah, then you are from the best of people. A quick short break. One day, my brothers and sisters, there was a brother that was staying at the night at the mosque one night. One night there was a brother that was staying at the mosque in the 10 days of Muharram. It was the night of the day of Ashura. So everyone, as it is known within culture, everyone remains at the mosque overnight. So everyone relaxed their legs, laid down, went to sleep. Except this one brother, he was very, uh, as you would say, very clenched up. His legs were together, his hands were together, and he was sleeping. So then, one of the brothers tries to wake him up. He wakes up. They say to the brother that was laying down, lay your legs, open your legs, extend your arms, extend, extend your legs. He says, no. Why not? He says, because you know this black cloth behind me. This black cloth is worthless in the shops. But the moment you hang it up in a mosque, it belongs to Hussein. The moment the flag comes up, it was a cheap flag and we wrote on it, Ya Hussein. It now belongs to Hussein. And it's disrespectful for me to extend my legs in front of something that belongs to Al Hussein. You see, sometimes people develop these connections with the Ahlul Bayt. Now to the point where very quickly before I end, inshallah, where we debunk a claim. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Many a times, we the Shia hear this saying Why is it that you focus so much on history? Why is it? That 1,400 years ago, you are still commemorating Al Hussein. For what need? Al Hussein is in paradise right now with his mother Fatima and his grandfather Rasulullah. Why are you still striking your chest for? The event came, it took place. There is no need to continuously mention history. Move on. When we come to answer this concept that this person aims to throw out, and when this person aims to throw this concept out, what is his agenda behind it? 
is to get rid of these gatherings. Is to get rid of the gatherings of remembrance. So he throws out that doubt. There is no need. This is history and leave history behind us. Move on. We will answer this. Firstly, in order for us to diagnose this issue, this question, this accusation, this claim, this argument, we need to divide it up into two categories. The first category, there is history that exists, my brothers and sisters, but this history does not, number one, have an impact on my aqeed, my creed, my ideology. There is history that took place, there are events that took place that do not play or have an impact on my jurisprudence, my fiqh. These history, you can place a question mark next to it. But when you have events in history that through these events, I build my aqeed and my ideology. That through these events, I build my creed. That through these events, my jurisprudence is built. Then no, it is not simply history and leave it behind us. Any time an event in history played an important role in understanding your Islamic creed and jurisprudential rulings, this is not something that is merely in the books of history and move on and open up another page. Understand that history that links you back to your imams isn't a random page in history that it is now time to change. The page. No. That's the first response. Response number two. People might say that the Quran isn't relevant today. 21st century. Why should I care about olives and figs and he said, she said, he died, he lived. 21st century, people are going to the moon, as they say. My brothers and sisters, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, what relevance does it have to me today living in the 21st century? When Allah speaks about Moses, what relevance does this have in my life? It's not going to, as the Arabs say, it's not going to bring my life forward or hold me back. This answer that someone might say to you, it's in history, leave it. This person has neglected many aspects and has underestimated his IQ and his intellect. He has sufficed himself with their bare minimum by saying we live in the present and neglect history. The story of Noah, what relevance does it have to me? Number one, it teaches me that there are warnings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed certain rules. If I cross them, punishment comes down. The first thing that we benefit in history is lessons and teachings. Don't go against your prophet, a punishment won't come down. Don't worship an idol, Allah won't. Send his wrath down upon you. That's the first thing in history. Lessons and messages that you can use to benefit. Number two, your jurisprudential rulings. Throughout the Quran, there were many times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the concept of the female menstrual cycle. These are jurisprudential rulings. The rulings of alcohol were mentioned in the Quran. These aren't random bits in history that we can neglect and move on. Due to the, the shortness of time, I will, ver I will summarize everything up right now. Historical events in the Quran that relate back to the Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verses 8 and 9 of Surah Al-Insan. He says, And they gave food in spite of love for it to the needy, the orphan and the captive. And they said, 
we feed you only for the countenance of Allah, we wish not from you reward or gratitude. Who was this revealed in relation to? The Ahlul Bayt. In another verse, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 55, Your guardian is Allah, His apostle, and the faithful who maintain their prayer and give the zakat while bowing down. Who was bowing down? Amir al-Mu'mineen. These are crucial bits in history that shape my aqidah, my ideology, my brothers and sisters. I can't neglect these. These are part of my belief, part of my religion. And inshallah ta'ala, I will leave the third or the fourth point to, to, until tomorrow. And that point is Al Hussein is a lesson and a tea. Al Hussein Abra wa Abra. Allahumma ajjil li waliyik al faraj umman alayna bi ridah. Wahab lana rafetahu wa rahmetahu wa dua'ah. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ahli baytihat tayyibin al tahirin.